Today we're going back to the very beginning. If you have your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter 1. That's where we will be today. The starting point, which sets the stage for everything else that happens. We lose sight of the first three chapters of Genesis. We have a very bad foundation on which to build our faith. Very, very shaky. Extremely important stuff. Now, I'm not going to talk today about the controversy over whether Genesis chapter 1 should be taken literally or figuratively. There's many people that battle over that. Some feel that if you have the wrong view on that, everything else you believe is wrong. Uh, I don't agree with that. I do think if you don't take it literally, at least you have to believe that what it teaches figuratively is true. That it is true what is taught in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. If you don't believe that, then you have no foundation for faith because it is absolutely foundational. So we will look at, uh, at not everything in, the, in this first chapter, but I'm going to start with uh, the very first verse, which says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Those first four words are really important. In the beginning God. That's where the book begins. In the beginning God. What was there in the beginning? God. Well, what was there before him? No. God. Well, what was he doing before creation? God. That's what it tells us. In the beginning, God. We're going to jump down now to verse 24. We're skipping five days of creation. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed and it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Where I want to begin with this today is at that very beginning. In the beginning, God. This Bible is God's story. We tend to think it's mankind's story, but that's just, that's like us. That's the way people are. That's the result of our fall. We always want to be the center of things. We want to be the main characters. This book starts with God, and it ends with God, and the story is God's dealings and God's plan and God's purpose and what God is doing. He is at center stage. If you want to think of a, uh, <laughs> of a play, he's center stage always. He has the most important lines. The spotlight is always on him. God is first. He is the center of all things. Now, it is the story of his dealings with mankind, but we're not the stars. God is. In fact, we just stumble along. If you, if you study this book, you'll learn that this is God's story, and humankind's part of it is to stumble and fall and mess up and forget and turn the wrong way from beginning till the end, when we're finally glorified. But it's the story of God in spite of all that, instead of all of our stumblings and all of our misunderstandings and all of our wrong choices, still making his plan go through to conclusion perfectly according to his will. The story goes according to his plan, 
we just stumbled along. This world is all about him. In the beginning, God. We have to say this because we live in a society, in a world, and it's been this way actually since the fall, that forgets and ignores and refuses to believe all that. It's all about us. Or all about some impersonal universe that's just started somehow and going on somehow without a God. The Bible clarifies it from the very beginning. In the beginning, God. It's his story. He is the star. We are bit players in this big story. I don't want to downplay when I say bit players because we're all important there. But it is God's story. The world is all about him. We are born into a universe created and maintained by God. He is the one who is the star. The universe is really a celebration of him. This is where our modern science, and not just modern science, down through the ages, this is where we've forgotten about that. This universe that, that scientists marvel over at its immensity and complexity and mystery is really a celebration of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth. We get to the book of, of Revelation. He destroys this heaven and this earth that he created and recreates a new perfect one for eternity, all according to his plan, in his time, and in his way. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, if you would like to turn there. Colossians 1, beginning with verse 15. By the way, this is one of those passages that tells in no uncertain terms that Jesus Christ is God. People that tell you the Bible never says Jesus is God have not really read the Bible. Or at least they haven't read the right parts of it. Because he says very clearly in the Gospels, he is God. And Colossians states it as clearly as it can possibly be stated, talking about Jesus, beginning with verse 15, Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, by the way, that's kind of an interesting statement. The image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. How do you have an image of invisibility? Well, Jesus Christ was that. He was God incarnate. He said, do you want to see what God looks like, the closest thing we can come to in actual things that are not spirit? Jesus Christ. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This universe we live in is a celebration of God. In spite of the fact that most of us most of our species, humans, completely misses that. All things were created through him and for him. Verse 17, he is before all things. In him, all things hold together. This universe is all about God. He is the center of all things. When we assert ourselves as the center of this world, we violate the very nature of this world, which is what mankind does. We assert that we are the center of all things, and we violate the very nature of what this world is we're created into. That's what the fall was all about. When God had that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do you realize before that, when it came to what was right and what was wrong, God called all the shots. And mankind rightfully said, okay, is this, is this right? In that area, check with God. Whatever he says is right. What's right, what's wrong? Whatever God says. He's the one that determines what's right and what's wrong. Because he is the perfect one. He is the holy one. He's the one who made it. And what happened when Adam and Eve, they didn't just eat the wrong apple. Their sin was not just picking the wrong fruit and eating it. It was a conscious rebellion saying, we want to make our own calls of what is right and what is wrong. We want to write our own script. We want to be on the center stage. And mankind has been doing that ever since. Thinking that it's all about us. And we can make our own choices. To the point today where people are actually choosing and are told they have the right to choose what gender they want to be 
no matter what, no matter how they were born. I mean, today we can do operations and we can have uh, hormonal therapy and take the right kind of pills and you can kind of be whatever gender you want to be by your own choosing. It's just a symptom of the fall. That's what it is, simply. A rebellion against the godness of God, de-godding God and making us the ones who calls what's right and what's wrong. But as we begin here, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and he made us and he made us with a purpose and he is sovereign there. When we assert ourselves as center of the world, we validate, violate the very nature of the world in which we live. Even though people don't see it, it is still true. And even though people don't believe in God, he is still God. And the truth is still the truth. This is what the Bible presents to us. By the way, if you don't believe this, everything else you believe is just going to be some kind of vague spirituality. This is the truth about the world in which we live. And when we say we believe the Bible is true, it starts right here. This is the foundation for everything. In the beginning, God. It is his story. He is the sovereign one. He is the one holding everything together. He is the one moving history towards his conclusion, no matter what people might think. It is all about him. He is the center of all things. The next thing we see in this passage, and we get to verses 24 and following of chapter 1, he is the owner of everything. If he's the one that created it, he's the one that owns it. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. By the way, Paul quotes that one in 1 Corinthians 10. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, and the whole world and all who dwell in it. We are the Lord's. When we are told through Christ Jesus that we are not our own, we are bought with a price, that's just us getting back to pre-fall, to the state where we were before that. Not owning ourselves, being owned by God. He's the owner. He created us. We're not our own. We were bought with a price. We were created not our own. We were created by a creator. We belong to him. What are we? We are his resident managers. It's interesting in, this, in Genesis 1, when you look at him talking about in the image of God, and that's kind of a puzzle for us. There's many, much debate on what does it mean that we are made in the image of God? Because we don't look like God. He's spirit, right? So we don't look like him physically. So what does it mean in the image of God? The main part of that is shared with us right in the very same sentence. God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and the cattle and over all things that creep on the earth. That's a big part of what it means to be in the image of God. He has placed us in charge, in a sense, an, an under God, small g, under his large g, Godhead, resident managers. That's how he created us. That's why we humans are smart enough to manage this world. Well, unfortunately, the fall has kind of messed that up, hasn't it? Because we have failed to see ourselves as as under shepherds, as resident managers, and started thinking we are in charge and we are the ones that call the shots. That's the problem with what mankind has been doing to the environment. And by the way, the solution to that is not going to be in laws that are passed. It's going to be in hearts that are changed so that we understand who we are and what our responsibility really is on this earth. But we are resident managers. He owns everything. And he owns us. And he has placed us in a position of authority as his resident managers of this earth. We are in his image, but we're not God. And we never will be. That's why that tree of the knowledge of good and evil is so important. We're not the ones that call the ultimate shots, yet we have usurped that authority in the fall, and that's the state of fallen mankind which is the answer or the reason for all of the trouble and problems we see in this world. It's interesting in that passage how God not only creates them in his image, he blesses them. Verse 28, God blessed them. If you look through Genesis, he didn't bless any other creation. There's no other creation that it says he blessed. Us, 
he blessed. We were made to be special in his image as his resident managers over this world he has created. And we know it's far more than that. He blessed us to have fellowship with himself, to communicate with us. We see that with Adam and Eve in the garden pre-fall and even after that. The only other thing we see blessed in the creation is when we get down to chapter 2, when he blessed the seventh day. That's the only other thing he blessed in all of this creation, that day in which he rested from all the work he did. By the way, we, we should take great attention or pay great attention to that too, but that's for another message, if not another series of messages, on how we, in our desire to be God, have really messed up God's plan for us to rest as a part of our lives, to refocus, to keep things in the proper order and not get hung up on our busyness and our striving and our trying to climb the ladder and all those things that we spend our time and energies doing. He who created us knew us so well. He knew that we needed rest, and he actually not only blessed us, he blessed the time of rest that we would have in him. That, that's, okay, that's for another message. He is not only the center of all things, he is the owner of all things, and we are his. We are part of what he owns. We are not our own. Now, what does this mean if we are resident managers? Now we get down to real life. Let's, let's get down to where the rubber meets the road in our lives here. Because this is where we sometimes lose sight of exactly what all this means. That it's all about God and that we are owned by God and we are just resident managers. He's in charge of us, which means he's in charge of everything, which means he's in charge of everything we have. In other words, here's a good one, our money. You know that money that we have earned with our hard work and shrewd management? It's his. It's his. We don't look at it that way very often. What am I going to do with my money? Let's see, what do I want? What new toys do I want to buy? What additions do I want to make? What, uh, what would I like to be driving next year? Instead of saying the right thing according to the order of creation, the way the world actually is, what does God want me to do with his money? By the way, this is a principle Jesus talks about a lot. He has more to say with things that have to do with money and possessions than almost anything else. Getting back to what began as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, including us, blessing us, making us in his image, and placing us in a position of responsibility. Jesus has several parables about talents and responsibility of what you're going to do with what God has given you. But the main thing they teach, we miss here in our 20th century affluent America, it's his money. It's his. It's not ours. We are resident managers of his money. What are, how are we going to spend his money? That's one of the areas where mankind has totally lost his way. And by the way, we at the church, as the church don't do as well with that as we think we do. What will we do with this little piece of God's money that he has given to us? And it's not just money. It's all of our possessions. They're God's. We don't own a thing. You think you own a house? No, God does. You think you have cars? God has cars. You think you have possessions? God does, and he's entrusted them to you. What are you going to do with God's possessions? What are you going to do with God's house? What are you going to do with God's cars? Then we get down to time. If God owns everything, he owns our time. Hmm. Now, there's an interesting one. What are we going to do with God's time? Have you ever thought about it that way? This is a principle from Genesis chapter 1. He is center stage in everything. He owns everything. It's all about him. We are bit players. So what do we do with God's time? Think of that, young people, when you're spending your wee hours of the morning on those silly computer games that you play. Okay, now I'm meddling, aren't I? What are you doing with God's time? All of you fantasy football, oh, now I'm really meddling. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Important. Now, we don't want to get hyper-legalistic. Okay, so every hour of every day I must be worshiping God. No, no, no. That, that's not what we're talking about here. That, that leads to failure. But a good thing to think about in how you're living your lives, it's God's. 
how am I using my time? Is it to glorify him or is it to glorify me? Is it to exalt his kingdom or is it to build my kingdom? By the way, that I think is mine, since that is a fallacy based on Genesis chapter 1. It's his kingdom is all that really matters. My kingdom is a mirage. I have no kingdom. I'm a member of the kingdom. He's my king. I'm called to serve him. What do we do with his gifts and talents? He has gifted us with abilities. And we are made in his image, and we are blessed. We have some amazing gifts and abilities. The human species is incredible. Some of the things that we do, the technology that we have developed, the artistic work that some people do, uh, just amazing what we can do. What are we doing with God's gifts and talents? They're God's. How are we using the abilities he's given us to glorify him and build his kingdom? Those are the right questions to be asking when we get our minds screwed on right about this one because we have all been seduced by the human fallenness in the world around us into forgetting that this is all about God and everything we have is his. And we started thinking just like Adam and Eve in the fall, now it's about us. It's about us. You know that we are encouraged in our world today to write your own story, right? Write your own story. Young people, write your own story. It's before you. Do whatever you want to do and just, it's all, everything is up to you. Oh, really? How about this? Young people, allow God to write your story because he's the one that's going to do it anyway. And we can do it in cooperation with him, or he can write the story with us rebelling at every turn. That's the truth of what scripture teaches us. We are not the free agents we think we are. We are created to be serving God. When we're not doing that, we're doing something we're not created to do. You ever try to mechanics? You ever try to do something with the wrong tool? You know, try to take out a screw with a pair of pliers? You can do it but it's gonna take you half an hour to what you can do in 30 seconds with a screwdriver. When we're doing things the way we wanna do them, we're doing something we were not created to do. Adam and Eve were created to defer to God on everything that is right and wrong. When they decided they were gonna do it themselves, they were in a mess of trouble because they were not made for that. Humankind is not made for making their own calls for right and wrong because we will mess that up every single time, and we have. Look at history, look at society, look at your own life. There it is. The message of Deuteronomy to the people about ready to go into the promised land was quite simple. Okay, I'm about to leave you with my presence. You know that, that pillar of smoke in the day and that fire by night which guided them. They didn't move until he moved. They didn't stop until he stopped. They waited until he moved to go. So that's not going to be with you. You're on your own now. So here's the thing. You do things my way, let me lead you, and it will go well. Do things your own way, and it will go poorly. The book of Deuteronomy just says that over and over and over again in several different ways before they entered the promised land. So it is with us. God owns everything. We are his resident managers. What are we doing with his money and his time and his possessions and his gifts? Because he owns it all. And the last thing I want to say follows up with that. He's the center of all things. He's the owner of all things. He alone is to be worshipped. He alone is to be worshipped. It's amazing what we human beings worship. We worship celebrity. Our culture worships celebrity. Don't we? Our culture worships sport heroes. Our culture worships sexuality. Our culture worships bling, those fancy, shiny things of affluence. Our society worships those things. There is only one thing in creation worthy of worship. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. Everything else after that is his creation and his work and his plan and his glory. We are here for his glory. He created us in his own image and blessed us for his glory that we might glorify him. And that's the call of the Gospels. Glorify God through Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our purpose for living. 
that we might glorify God through Jesus Christ. He alone is worthy of our worship. By the way, you do a study in the Bible on what worship is. You come up with about four things, basically. One is to bow down, to humble ourselves before. Another one is to obey. When you worship, you obey. There's no way you can worship God without obeying him. There's no way you can come and say on Sunday morning, oh, praise God, and just get all emotional in the singing of hymns, and then go out and don't do his will. That's empty. Our, our real worship is how we follow and obey God. Uh, Sunday through Sunday, not just on, on Sunday morning. To trust, to worship is to trust, to believe in him, to trust him. And finally, to serve him. If you're going to worship something, you're going to serve it. And we are designed to serve. You know, Bob Dylan, in his, his brief little flirting with Christianity, had it right in some of his songs. You're going to serve someone. It might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you're going to serve someone. He had that right. That's all part of what worship is. We humans, by our, in our fallenness, want to decide what we worship. We want to decide what we are going to obey. We want to decide what we are going to serve. And you know what it always ends up being when we do that? It ends up being our own lusts. And that always just seems like the right thing to do. Follow your heart. Anybody who just seeks out to follow their heart, it sounds so wonderful. It's on slogans. It's on posters. Write your own story. Follow your heart. You know what you end up doing every single time? You're going to be following your own lusts. And that hasn't worked for mankind yet. And yet God in Christ has come to us. He has broken into our world. He has revealed his truth to us. Through this word, he has revealed his truth that we were made in his image, blessed by him to glorify him by being his servants and serving him by ruling well with all of this that he has given to us, all of this wonderful world, all of these gifts and abilities, all this intelligence, all this awareness. He's given to us to be his servants and to faithfully worship him, to share in his glory. We of all creatures, the only things in the universe. Now people like to speculate, is there life on other planets? Biblically I'd say, I don't know, but there doesn't have to be, probably isn't. You say, wait a minute, there has to be. No, if you believe that we came by the way science tells us we came, then there has to be. Somewhere out there, if you believe that this is true, what the Bible teaches, there may be nothing else out there but God. And our call is to worship and serve, trust, obey him. He is holy. He is eternal. He is the center stage of everything that's going on. You can study history. You see God's hand behind it from beginning to end. He owns us and everything we know and everything we have, and he alone is worthy of our worship. That's why we gather together on Sunday mornings like this. It's not just for a social hour to see our good old friends again. That's a side benefit. Number one is we come in the presence of God to acknowledge who he is, to express our love and adoration and worship and be encouraged and reminded that this is the reality of the world. And when we do this, humbly serve him, we are doing exactly what we were created to do and that blessing then flows through us. That's basic stuff. Everything else in the Bible is built on this. This is the starting point. It starts with God, it ends with God, it never starts or ends with us. That's the deception. So what is the call for us? The call for us is what the call of Scripture, the call of Jesus Christ always is for us. Repent. Reorder your lives around what you now know or now reminded of. Believe it and follow him. That's the gospel call. The gospel according to Jesus. The kingdom of God is here. Reorder your lives around that. Repent. Believe it and follow him. That's our call. To remember who owns it all. To remember who we are, who he is. And believe it and follow. And change our lives where they need to be changed by his power. That's the daily call 
of the Spirit of God. Let's pray.